What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And on this episode of Faith of Our Fathers, we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark, and we're even adding a little bit of catechesis. Stick around. <music> So today is Monday, the first Monday in the first week of Lent and during this penitential time in the church where we may or may not be fasting from something, it is time to take a solid look at what Jesus says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So we continue through the treasury of daily prayer for Lent, meditating on the word of God. So we begin this Monday in the first week of Lent in the Gospel of Mark, verse 1 of chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bernagus, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. So, interesting, quick meditation on this before we get to the quote uh, for the day from Martin Luther. It was the Sabbath, the day of rest, the third commandment. Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy and Tradition, which is a very good thing, but is oftentimes abused, tradition grew that you're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. But as we come to learn through the Gospels and the teachings of the Apostles, Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And so we look at this and we might ask ourselves, what do they care whether or not Jesus heals someone on a Saturday? But it's important because Jesus, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, they had been abusing the commandment. They had created, out of good nature, laws to protect it. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And they were mad at Jesus for no other reason than violating their tradition. And Jesus gets into this uh, with them a little bit more when the disciples are eating and they didn't wash their hands. And, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and that's where we get the phrase traditions of men from. But let's get into our reading from Martin Luther, and then we're going to get into a little bit of catechesis. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In order to raise up Adam after the fall, God gave him this promise when he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 In this word of promise, Adam, together with his descendants, was carried, as it were, in God's bosom. And by faith in it, he was preserved waiting patiently for the woman who would bruise the serpent's head as God had promised. And in that faith and expectation, he died. 
not knowing when or who she would be, yet never doubting that she would come. For such a promise, being the truth of God, preserves even in hell those who believe it and wait for it. After this came another promise made to Noah, to last until the time of Abraham, when a bow was set in the clouds as a sign of the covenant, Genesis 9, 12-17, by faith in which Noah and his descendants found God gracious. After that, he promised Abraham that all the nations should be blessed in his seed, Genesis 22, 18. And this is Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, 22, into which his descendants have been received. Then to Moses and the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 18, 8, and especially to David, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Deuteronomy 18, 18. He gave the plainest promise of Christ and thereby at last made clear what the promise to men of old really was. And so it finally came to the most perfect promise of all, that of the New Testament, in which, with plain words, life and salvation are freely promised and actually granted to those who believe the promise. So, God gave to Adam and Eve, <clears throat> before he even cursed them, if you'll notice, a promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And so we, Adam and Eve, waited for that woman, for that seed. They waited for she, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer, the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to come. And it's interesting to note seed is often associated with men, isn't it? Men uh, bear the seed, <laughs> so to speak, but God promised the seed of the woman, that this unnatural birth would redeem our sinful birth. And as the Old Testament progresses through history, God's promise becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as he continues to make the same promise and faith in the promise is what sustains his church now for our catechesis during this lenten tide during this season of repentant joy we're going to start by focusing on the ten commandments as we're in a season of repentance i think it would be fair to consider how far short we fall of god's standard and to repent and to beseech our lord for mercy so we begin the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. A god means that from which we are to expect all good and in which we are to take refuge in all distress. So to have a god is nothing other than trusting and believing him with the heart. I have often said that the confidence and faith of the heart alone makes both god and an idol. If your faith and trust is right, then your god is also true. On the other hand, if your trust is false and wrong, then you do not have the true God. For these two belong together, faith and God, Hebrews 11.6. Now, I say that whatever you set your heart on and put your trust in is truly your God. And this comes to us from the large catechism. Also from the large catechism, we are to trust in God alone and look to him and expect from him nothing but good as from one who gives us body, life, food, drink, nourishment, health, protection, peace, and all necessaries of both temporal and eternal things. He also preserves us from misfortune. And if any evil befall us, he delivers and rescues us. So it is God alone, as has been said well enough, from whom we receive all good and by whom we are delivered from all evil. Likewise, from the large catechism. Another one. Even though we experience much good from other people, whatever we receive by God's command or arrangement is all received from God. For our parents and all rulers and everybody else with respect to his neighbor have received from God the command that they should do us all kinds of good. So we receive these blessings not from them, but through them from God. For creatures are only the hands, channels, and means by which God gives all things. So he gives to the mother breasts and milk to offer to her child, and he gives corn and all kinds of produce from the earth for nourishment. As from Psalm 104, 27 through 28, and Psalm 147, 8 through 9, none of these blessings should be produced by any creature of itself. 
you shall have no other gods. Now, this is certainly a command we should obey. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But this is also a promise. There is coming a day in the new heaven and the new earth where God promises you shall have no other gods. I hope this blesses your Lenten meditation as we continue with the reading from Scripture, the faith of our fathers, and catechesis. We pray. Lord Jesus, prepare us for that eternal Sabbath when you will rest in us, just as now you work in us. The rest that we shall enjoy will be yours, just as the work that we now do is your work done through us. But you, O Lord, are eternally at work and eternally at rest. It is not time that you see or in time that you move or in time that you rest, yet you make what we see in time. You make time itself and the repose which comes when time ceases. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.